Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> hey, 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 don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila. Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to thenextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I think, Andy, it's hard to talk about the trailer for Nine Queens for a guy like me, a guy who does not speak Spanish, uh, because the American trailer sucks, <laughs> and I can't understand the Spanish trailer. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a little tricky. Um, the English trailer feels like you know they they found a way to cut it. It's one of those. Uh, there's a there's a. I'd say I don't know. I feel like. 75 or 80 percent of foreign language trailers that we see cut by American trailer cutters do it in a way where they're trying to not use any of the foreign dialect. It's just narration and images. And this one falls into that. The other smaller percent does have some of the subtitles and that kind of, you know, you get a sense of the story. This one really just kind of sells the story, but it does it in a way where it's just I don't know, it feels like um you know, it's not the Star Trek Beyond trailer cutters <laughs> cutting the trailer yeah, together. Right. It's not bad though. I mean, it sells the it sells the the uh, the whole stamp con that our two guys are putting on, and to to that extent, it lets us know that we're going into a con story. So you know, I mean, it works. Look at these Latin people. <laughs> They're speaking Spanish, but you aren't thinking Spanish because I'm speaking English. <laughs>
That's what it, that's what we get. I, I hear you now. You're right. It, it sells the grift, yeah. right? I mean, that's what we need to get. And through uh, uh, some fast cuts and great sort of action sequences, we 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 see that this is a this is a con story. It also it sells that this is a Ricardo Darín film, and that ends up being really important, I think, uh, and and is sort of the ultimate next level con of the movie. Uh, that that it is a Ricardo Doreen film, but it, there's also a twist there that that uh, I think is really important that um, uh, that changes the way you think about him and his character that I really really like. Putting him uh, in there, uh, kind of at the head of the trailer, I think it really helps. I mean, he's I don't know if there if he had been in many films that had kind of crossed into uh, American audiences before this film. I mean, he certainly was busy. I mean, he's been acting since the 60s um, on t- on Argentine uh, television. Um, I don't know, like, at what point did some of the films that he started being uh, a, a part of start crossing the border? Like, would people have recognized, oh, that's Ricardo Darín? I don't know. I'm not sure. The Spanish trailer, uh, it's, yeah, like you, my Spanish is a little rusty. I couldn't really pinpoint everything. But it, it kicks it off, My from what I could tell, it kicks it off with his big speech about like just the swindlers that are everywhere and they're all around us. And I thought that was a really interesting way to kind of get it started and, and sell this idea that, you know, there is crime going on everywhere around you. And, you know, and then you come to find out and we're just two of the guys who are a part of that. And I thought that was an interesting way to kick it off. I do like that the, uh, that the Argentine trailer does have the, um, the uh, what is it? The Rita uh, Pavon uh, song is that what her name is? Yeah, um, Rita Pavone. Yeah, Pavone. Pavone's song "Il Bal Bayo de, del Matone." It, yes, I like that too. Although I, I I I couldn't help but think about you know comparing it to using sabotage. <laughs> Is this song that famous that it compares to using the Beastie Boys in Star Trek Beyond? <laughs> well, if anything, this song is at least a little more current. <laughs> it's not hundreds of years old. Uh, I mean, uh, right. you know, she's obviously Italian, so she is of a different uh, descent. She's not from Argentina. Uh, I don't. You don't know where the Beastie Boys are from. <laughs> I don't even get what your comparison is, man. Juan and Marcos. Always work alone. Until today. Now they have one day to find, steal, then sell a one of a kind for the biggest payout of their career. But first, they must fool a forger, a fox, a brilliant beauty. Charm a sweet old lady. <laughs> Deal in a dirty cop. <laughs> Cheat a millionaire. Trust each other. And hang on to the nine queens. This is the next reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that over there is Andy Nelson. Hola, hola, hola. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, we're kicking off our series on Argentinian actor Ricardo Darín with Fabian Belinsky's 2000 con thriller Nine Queens. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Next Reel. And if you enjoy this show and are interested in supporting our ongoing work investigating great film, please consider a regular donation through our Patreon page. You'll get to join our back-channel conversations on Slack, listen to the members-only weekend show, and get better chances of being a part of our listeners' choice episodes. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the next reel. Andy, I, before we talk uh, about the movie... Uh, at great uh, uh, exhaustive length, are, are you relieved a little bit to have, have had to watch this movie for the show? Are you? Were you? Did you find yourself sufficiently finished with Star Trek? I was ready for a change. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was riveted by this movie. I think this was the. It came at just the right time. How did the? How did we end up with a Ricardo Doreen series on our schedule? We had a a, a listener, and this was, um, I think it's at uh, Paleo 
underscore, I think, uh, Carlos Rocha over on Twitter, who um, ages ago, we we had just kind of thrown an idea out there saying, hey, what, you know, what kind of series are you guys interested in? And uh, he threw this uh, to us saying, oh, you guys should uh, talk about the uh, fantastic Argentinian actor, Ricardo Darín. And I think we looked at each other like, oh, never heard of him before, but uh, maybe we'll have to look into him. And you look into him and you realize that, that Darin had been in uh, the uh, 2009 uh, film from Argentina, The Secret in Their Eyes, that uh, won uh, Best Foreign Language Film. It, he had been in uh, Wild Tales, a 2014 film that was also nominated for an Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. He, he's been in a lot of really uh, big, popular uh, films. And uh, we're like, oh, this guy's like, he's a big actor from down there. It, it might be worth looking at. And it took a while for us to uh, to kind of get around to it. But it's something we've had on our list for quite a while. And I, I don't remember what it was that uh, that kind of spurred us on to finally add him, uh, add this series to, uh, to the lineup. But, um, you know, after watching this, I'm really glad we finally got around to it. Oh, me too. What a uh, fantastic find. It turns out Ricardo Durian is sort of like uh, the, uh, he's an Argentinian George Clooney. <laughs> right. Um, right. He spent years and years on television. He was, a, he had a very successful television career. And this, it, from the looks of it, was the film that allowed him to break into um, uh, roles of substance, of great substance in uh, Argentinian cinema. And uh, certainly well earned, um, and his portrayal in this film as uh, the the you know street savvy con uh, in Buenos Aires is uh, absolutely fantastic. I deeply enjoyed this movie, and watching him on screen, it was that same sense of charisma. Like this guy, I want to hang out with this guy. I wanted to be Juan, his his partner in crime, <laughs> and figure out how to get the old lady to give me the purse in two minutes. Like I wanted that. Watching him, I, I completely agree. It's like he, he you want him on your best friends that haven't uh, met us yet list, right? Yes. Like he's that yes. sort of. Uh, he's got such great charisma on screen, and watching him, I'm like, why have I not seen him before? Why is he an actor that hasn't uh, pushed to make the break into American films? Um, I don't know, but I love that he's doing great uh, films down in Argentina and doing some, from what I can tell, doing some really great stuff. I mean, he is an actor. He, he is kind of like George Clooney. I mean, he's been acting since he was a little kid. Um, his parents are both uh, actors. He, he worked in uh, you know, opera uh, or uh, soap operas and and comedies on TV before he started getting into the films and and uh, he's just kind of you know bred in the industry and clearly watching this film it's like wow this is a guy who who understands the craft and how to how to uh, handle a performance I just I was mesmerized by him. As despicable totally. as a guy as he is, it, right, right. He, you know, he's he's despic despicable. He gets what's coming to him, uh, and uh, you know. But to your point about why he hasn't made the push into more uh, international um, films, it, it's interesting. Like apparently, he rejected the opportunity to play uh, in Man on Fire with Denzel. Uh, because he was going to be playing a drug trafficker, and he didn't like how uh, Hollywood was stereotyping uh, Latin Americans, and so that that may be a part of it. It may be because there is not a a solid and conscientious road um, for uh, you know great. Uh, Latin parts that don't somehow involve, you know, going through the role, these crappy drug trafficking roles, right? I mean, it, it, is is that the cost of of breaking out of South American film? That's entirely possible. I mean, if you uh, if you look at other people who have kind of tried to break in over here, uh, they've certainly fallen into the uh, um, the same uh, traps where they've had to, um, you know like play the bad, you know, um, yeah. Michael Nick, Gangs, even Michael, Michael Nickvist from, uh, from, uh, uh, Europe. I mean, he had to come in, uh, coming off of the, the heels of the fantastic, the girl with the dragon tattoo. And I mean, he ended up doing, uh, playing a lot of bad guy roles, uh, you know, yeah. over here. And it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's great roles, uh, mission impossible, ghost protocol, John wick. Uh, but still it's like, uh, I don't know how many, 
uh, films he did over here, English language films, where he was like a, a good character. I mean, there probably have been some, but it, not nearly as many as the ones that are the prominent uh, antagonist roles. Well, and and to be clear, I mean, these are you're talking about some some actually really good evil roles, right? Sure, good, yeah, yeah, bad guys. And I think what we're talking about here with with Doreen turning down, you know, roles about drug trafficking. You know, I mean, this is like it, it's it's these stereotype roles. There isn't a really great rich palette of uh, to draw from beyond the sort of stereotypes in, in sure. some of these scripts. And so that's that's I, I think a an issue to to be aware of that uh, you know. Um, he's, he's got a lot to choose from down there. And this was a great, just a great experience watching him on screen. I can understand why he wouldn't want to, you know, sell out for too much, you know? Yeah. I mean, if, if this is the sort of role he's getting, uh, yeah. absolutely just stick with it. Cause he's doing great stuff. I just, I, I, I want now to get more people up here to, uh, yeah. and around the world to just see his films though. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is a really exciting uh, catalog, and I think our, the four films that we're talking about in this particular series are great films to check out. Um, a, a couple of them, uh, the first two, this one, uh, actually, I put a link to it. I, I don't know. There are several versions of this film on YouTube, the full film with captions. Uh, one of them is linked in the show notes uh, for your information if you're interested in watching this film. And it's pretty good. It's not great high resolution. Don't watch it on 4K because <laughs> it'll look <laughs> pretty terrible. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's serviceable and the captions are good. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you have trouble finding it, getting it, you know, that's where to go. It's not streaming anywhere and you can't get this one on iTunes. Um and I think next week's film we had some trouble getting too. So check your libraries and and um, uh, there is a there is a very strange post of it on YouTube. Uh, apparently it was for Patty and whoever <laughs> posted it included subtitles that include a birthday message for Patty. Yeah, it's um, very strange. So if you know Patty, wish her a happy birthday in the comments and then watch the movie because the rest of it's pretty good there too with the <laughs> captions. So uh, anyhow. Um, the, the other two films are obviously big international hits, and uh, they are available in uh, many more places digitally and um, easier to get the, the DVDs. Blu-rays? Or did you Blu-ray them? Uh, I haven't watched either of them yet, but uh, I, okay. I think that both uh, yeah, both Secret of, in Their Eyes and Wild Tales, I believe, are both available um, as Blu-rays from Netflix. So if you are renting it yeah. that way, um, this one came, it is Netflix does have the DVD of, of, uh, of this film though. So if you're in the U S okay. and you want you to check out nine it. Queens, you can rent it uh, from Netflix. So this is a great series to get to know Ricardo Doreen as we have. And now let's talk a little bit more detail about this particular film. It, it's one of those movies that was delightful to watch because I didn't know the twists uh, and it was that much more fun to watch after I knew the twists. And, you know, it's kind of a hard line on films that you really, really want to watch again after you know what happened uh, or, you know, what the twist was. And this, for me, was absolutely, um, you know, the the former. I, I wanted to dig back in and see what I missed and watch where the, the eyes move in, from scene to scene and the knowing glances and those kinds of, of little twists of character that I think make this a, a really special watch. Yeah, it's it it is a great one with just so many different uh, twists and turns, kind of through the course of the film. Um, we should say, I mean, we always say we spoil movies, but definitely you want to watch this one before you listen to our conversation because we're just going to ruin the hell out of it for you. Yeah, um, yes, that's <laughs> it's kind of the that's where we live. Yep. But I did see the uh, the um, American remake of this that came out in 2004 uh, called Criminal. I did see that one um, when it came out, and I was uh, pretty impressed with the uh, the twists and turns of the story then. I don't think I was as impressed with the film itself, um, nor of the cast, um, but I enjoyed the twists and turns. Um, so this one, I kind of um, I kind of knew what the setup was and everything, but um, but still, just watching it. Um, you find that uh, it, these the, the people are just doing such a great job that it almost doesn't matter. For this film, I, I feel like so much of it, and, and this was his first, uh, this was uh, Belinsky's uh, first big film, right? So It was, yeah. Uh, it, I was really surprised at just how competent a, a thriller that this ended up being, uh, given that it's his first film. It just reeks of Mammoth and a little bit of Hitchcock, and it's, uh, you know, it, it plays on a, a, a an intimate but very 
um, opinionated uh, palette, right? These characters are all, you know, occupy their own very unique space. Um, and, and in particular, our two, um, you know, principal characters, uh, just how well they sort of portray uh, each side of the uh, ego angst uh, scale uh, made anytime they're on screen together, uh, really fascinating. The thing that I, I was struck by the entire time is I don't trust anybody that I'm watching at any point in this <laughs> film ever. I know I'm going to be betrayed, but it does such a brilliant job, this film, of like tossing me back and forth from hand to hand. Like, uh, you know, just when I thought I had it figured out, they would toss me to the other direction. And now I would I would have to second guess what I was looking at just when I figure out, oh, now I totally get this. Oh, no, nope, no, you don't. You don't get this anymore. And I think it just it, it is an, an incredibly adept and mature uh, bit of filmmaking that um, that surprised me from uh, this first time filmmaker. Yeah. And uh, what I think was so refreshing was having having moments with with uh, the characters particularly Juan where you kind of you know get to spend time with him outside of the outside of the con and and really just get a kind of a, a sense of his world uh, a couple moments that really struck me was when he goes to visit his father in prison and uh, he has that just great conversation with his dad there um, and that kind of pushes him to you know stay in the game as it were um, although that's all kind of a plan as you later yeah, find out. Yeah, it's all part of the con, right? But just but the moment with his dad obviously isn't. It's just it's a really nice moment that he has with his dad just kind of his dad who was another uh grifter who is in prison for it and he goes and talks to his dad and it's just like this this nice moment there you know this little card game that his dad is kind of doing with him and everything. I I just I loved the moment between the two of them. And the other one that I really enjoyed was the, it was just a really quiet moment when he's on the subway. Juan is on the subway. And there's this, this like this uh, like this homeless kid who's walking around giving people tarot cards, and I guess it's just one of those things where he walks by and gives them tarot cards, and then he comes back and you either give him money to keep the tarot card or you give him the tarot card back. And Juan, you know, he he had earlier he got this little car uh, toy because it reminded him of you know when of his youth with his dad. And he puts the the money for the tarot card on one knee and the car on the other knee to see what the boy will take. And the boy takes the money and then he calls the boy back and gives him the car. It's just, that's just such a it's such a, a simple moment, but it there was there was some like weight carried there about just kind of Juan's personality and just the value he had placed in this and and passing passing it over to this boy and just like i don't know i it was just it was this this kind of this moment of tenderness and this this kind of understanding and compassion and I, it was really I, I really liked it i i totally agree and i i think you know as much as this is a ricardo doreen film the, the role of juan is played by gaston pauls and he is so great in this movie um, be, because of those moments of uh, just sort of intimacy that he has with this boy and with his dad. And the conversation with his dad, I think, is really special because, as you say, I you know, I, I sort of said that it was part of the con, and that's obviously not quite what I meant because he knows he's part of the con, but his dad doesn't. And what makes that special is that his dad is trying once again to tell him, you're not ready for this, right? And... In fact, he's running this little uh, card game, right? And, and you know, he's trying to find the ace. He's, he's trying to get, you know, Juan to find the ace. And uh, he finds the ace every time, every time Juan finds the ace until the last time where his dad actually, it turns out, had been playing him all along. And he, he palmed the ace. We have no ace. And uh, Juan gets to look at it in surprise, realizing, oh, I, I didn't have it. And his dad says, you know, you, know you, you can't handle it. You can't handle this game. All the while, uh, you know, what we don't know is that Juan, in fact, is running the master con on all of us through the course of this of this film and ultimately um, resolves that that he had it under control the entire time. That's a great moment where Juan, uh, what we're seeing is over the course of the film, Juan is his father and and marcos is juan and and yeah. it's it's juan basically you know he he knows what his dad is doing and he he knows what this whole con is and he is in a place where he's really the one saying to marcos you really aren't 
ready for this. You know, we've we've pulled the wool over your eyes and you're never going to see it. Do you want to talk a, a little bit about the, um, you know, I, I sort of spoiled it, right? Here we are. Juan, Juan's the guy. Uh, and uh, But do we want to talk about the mechanics of it at all? Will that help the rest of the conversation make more sense? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 one of those uh, stories that's kind of like the game where it's kind of like everybody that you meet is involved <laughs> as you as yeah. you get to the end and you're like, here's the big scene where it's like, oh, everybody that you know we've we've seen has uh, had a part to play in this whole thing. And it's all about, uh, uh, you know, uh, Marcos, this, this situation that happened between Marcos and his sister Valeria, where he had basically seen an opportunity to swindle um, her and their brother out of the, uh, the money that their uh, parents had left them when they died or their grandparents. And, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it's this this whole con is basically put on by Valeria and Juan in order to basically get the money away from Marcos and back into their hands. And uh, when you realize that at the end, it's like oh, that's that's what this whole thing was about is is this this deal to just you know shut Marcos out and and make things right again, as it were. Absolutely. And that is so two points on on that that I I couldn't shake. One, uh, this has the same sort of ode to the craft of the con that I I get when I watch the prestige, right? When you see that sort of celebration of this is how far we're going to go to bury ourselves in this role. uh, Or the the uh, sting. Or, or the sting, right? But but I'm sp- thinking specifically about sort of the metaphor of the old Chinese guy with the, you know, with the, um, uh, with the glass or with the, the fishbowl between his legs, right? He spends his oh, entire sure, yeah. life, right? His entire life is devoted to playing this part. Well, here we go. Um, you know, uh, Valeria, the sister, um, she's clearly involved in this thing for a year or more because, um, you know, that's how long she's been dating uh, Juan secretly. We have this fantastic moment about 31 minutes into the film where where uh, Marcos asks Valeria, uh, you know, are, are you dating anybody? And uh, she says, yeah, I'm, I'm dating somebody. But in that moment, her eyes uh, dart over to Juan and watching it the second time, uh, I'm, I just, it hits me right between the eyes that that's, that's a move. That's a nod to the fact that, that she is uh, part of something much bigger to me. And it's just much more of, of a satisfying exchange, uh, whether or not that was an intentional, uh, sort of gift, uh, you know, to those who've seen the film once, uh, I don't know, but it certainly was much more satisfying to watch. So um, this sort of ode to the craft and and just how far they'll go. Uh, ultimately, when the film is re- is over and we reveal that he's walking through this warehouse and you see everybody who is involved, you see the motorcycle guys who steal the the uh, the stamps uh, uh, on the street. You see the the nine queens designs on the drafting table that he walks by. You get the nine queens cigar box and and you know his chips in them. Um, you see. Uh, uh, the the drunk Spaniard Vidal uh, is Boris, and he's packing up all of his his uh, uh, stuff. You you see the entire all the mechanics and all the people who were involved uh, sitting around the table, and ultimately, then he goes and kisses Valeria, um, and and uh, and so it, it is that ode to craft that I think is just fantastic. Second. It resolves then, right? And this is where I think it it parts from <laughs> Mammoth, where you you don't have any sort of um, uh, like it's done. All debts are paid. There is no more retribution to be had. They they get their money. The story ends. There is no bookend. There's nothing else. It's just a satisfying resolution, and it leaves our hero uh, or who we thought was the hero, Ricardo Darin, uh, out on the street broke. None the wiser. I, didn't you find that satisfying? Like, I thought that was exactly the way I needed it to play out. Oh, it was just, it was brilliant. I mean, the look on his face when when he gets to the bank and he talks to his friend and his friend is like, oh, you're not going to cash this here. Um, and he realizes that the checks are as phony as the stamps were. And he yeah. just has that look where he he looks back at, at Juan in just kind of complete loss, like, oh, we've been had. And Juan just kind of shakes his head and turns and walks away. Um, it, it, that's just such a brilliant moment because 
that's that's that moment where you know the con artist is finally uh is conned and is realizing it like in that moment and it's just like that complete uh you know utter loss of what to do because he's just like i I don't know that's it it's all over and and juan just walks out of there and and that's the end for marcos and it's just it's it's exactly what he deserved and and what did you i mean did you know at that point did you get it who was like who was playing whom at that point? Well, I had remember I had seen Criminal, so oh, yeah, so I knew. Seen it, so you shouldn't even yeah. Yeah, I I was really torn. I was really torn, and again, back to the sort of ultimate betrayal of the of the casting of this thing, because they put the sort of bigger name. I guess at this point, this is all the gift of hindsight. But because Ricardo Doreen was in that role, I thought surely it's going to turn around and. He's going to have some sort of miraculous thing. This this whole bank failure is somehow going to be once again him playing Juan, or, or you know maybe it's Juan playing him. I just didn't know. Uh, not until um, after the train, after he was on the train and met the the tarot card kid, he gets off the train and he walks through that giant passageway into that sort of warehouse. Uh, it was that cut as he's walking. We, we're behind him. It's a very wide shot, and we see this whole front facade of this warehouse, and he walks in, and it was at that moment, before we saw everybody else, but at that moment, that cut was the giveaway, that they wouldn't obviously wouldn't have spent that much time following Juan if, there was, if he wasn't the resolution to the story. Um, and, and that was when it all sort of landed. I didn't know what I was going to see, but I was pretty sure that Valeria was going to be there, and... Um, and that he was going to have have found a way to get to the other side of this. Yeah, right. But the whole movie, I mean, that's pretty rare that you can get to the end of a movie and still be not entirely sure where it's going to play out these days. No, it's it is really rare, and I, I think it speaks well to the the craftsmanship that uh, Bielinski had with with putting this con together. That it is done in such a strong way, where it it right up to that moment, you really aren't sure of exactly how it's going to end up playing out. Uh, you know, because you can be following one, but you're not necessarily expecting to see all those people pop up. It's like, whoa, hold on, hold the phone. Why are all these people here? And and then you're like, wow, okay, hold on. This is this whole big thing that is so much bigger than I had ever known uh, up until this moment. We say that, the that you know, this was his first big film, but he, it, um, Bielinski had much more of a, of a, professional history in the business than just that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Bielinski had, um, I mean, he had um, written some scripts for some films. He'd directed some short films. Um, he had worked as an assistant director in the commercial and film industry for a very long time. Uh, I think he'd worked on over 400 projects. But um, it, it was at this point where he was still struggling like to, to get people to believe that he could actually helm a feature film. And he had written this script in 1997. And I think this is one because he had written for other people before but I think he just really wanted to handle this one himself, but he couldn't sell it. And it finally, like after a year or more of trying to get it sold and nothing coming of it, he finally found this contest where, I I wish there were more contests like this, where it was a script uh, contest that guaranteed a production contract um, at the end for the winning script. And his script won, and he got the budget to actually make this. It wasn't a huge budget. It was about $1.3 million. But he actually got the money to go out and make it. And that's a very exciting story, uh, you know, for a young director like this who um, had a lot of experience in the industry, but no one would give him that chance and, and believe in him that he could actually step up to do it. Um, it they, they filmed this um, uh, very much guerrilla style, right? I, I had my, myself, you know, I'm, when I watch films like this, I'm often sort of fixated on what's going on behind the uh, principal characters in the scene, because I am sure that somebody is looking at the, the space where things are being filmed and has a look of shock or like their jaw drops or something, or they point and stare. And I didn't see any of that, but this, this was still shot naked, right? I don't know uh, completely ha- like how often it was, but I think there were a lot of scenes. I mean, you know, my understanding from uh, Bielinski is that they did film a lot of these scenes in the streets with just people walking around. Um, and I think that's a really interesting when you have somebody like uh, Darin who had been, you know, a prominent Argentine 
um, actor up through that point, people would have recognized him. But I, maybe it just goes to show how good they were in their performances that people just weren't even staring or anything. They, they, people just went on with uh, their business. And I, I really like that. And you get a real sense of that through a lot of this. I, I enjoy the camera work. Uh, a lot of the times when we are outside um, as they're walking the streets, it's like very long lens shots. It feels very voyeuristic as if we are, you know, cops almost watching these criminals as they're kind of going about their day. I found that a really interesting way to shoot. And obviously, to a certain extent, for a low budget filmmaker putting this film together, it helps when the camera's really far away. Nobody's paying attention to these people that are just walking by. Well, and and the cameras actually end up moving with uh, you know with the actors uh, you know an awful lot, which I think is is another thing that gives us that sort of voyeur sense that we're sort of walking in front of them and peeking behind over our shoulders. You know, it feels um, uh, almost as much of a uh, Fincher in Seven. You know, where we're just sort of hanging out. If you made it dark and it raining, it it could very well have have played for that that sort of a of a weird um, uh, a pairing. Uh, on screen. It just looked really good and it felt really good as we're wandering through uh, the streets with them. Uh, it, it's been three months, Andy, but I think we actually have a first shot, last shot we should at least acknowledge. I, I think so too. I think Star Trek, it was just like, you know, the I swear, I, I probably every film, except for maybe yeah. a, a couple, it ends with a shot of the the Enterprise, you know, warping away. And it just didn't, right. didn't really give us much to talk about with first shot, last shot. But this film, you're right, it has a great uh, pairing. The first shot is an extreme close up of a cigarette being used to light another cigarette that Juan happens to be holding um, before he decides to go into the gas station and pull his grift. And the last shot is a long panning shot uh, over uh, Juan. Uh, after seeing everybody involved in this, as we already sort of walked through, he, he goes to this couch and, and we see Valeria there in her casual clothes now and hair is down. Uh, she's relaxing. They kiss. He gives her the money uh, as their first anniversary present and then gives her the ring and on the very last cue, right as their lips are about to come together, he says, oh, I remember. I remember it. And <laughs> cue the Rita Pavone song, which was such a nice touch. That was really great. Um, yeah. And at, at first glance, like the first shot, last shot, they don't really pair together. It's like, how is this this paired? I mean, you certainly don't realize it when you're looking at this first shot. But when you step back and you at the end of the film and you realize, oh, it starts off with... This is the this is basically not about Juan getting ready to go pull a grift on this gas station. This is the moment where Juan is basically getting himself ready to go in and start this whole con that's going to last for like a day and a half on Marcos because he knows Marcos is in this gas station and this is the start of it all and the last shot is the final resolution of this entire con that they just pulled on him. It, it is fantastic because the implication of the pairing of these shots, you know, reminds us that why he's, you know, using a cigarette to light another cigarette is that he's probably been standing there for a while, is that probably leading up to this is, um, you know, who knows, days of trying to track Marcos and get him in just the right place at just the right time. And so that he can, you know, push that domino over to actually start this whole thing running. And, and so uh, it, it sort of unveils the machine that is going on in the narrative that I think is really satisfying. It's just so much fun. Yeah, it was really interesting. You know, something I was just thinking about. Um, so he starts off smoking here. After they leave this gas station, uh, it, is, it turns out when when Marcos like pulls this whole, you know, uh, extra grift on these gas station attendants saying, oh, I'm, I'm a cop. I'm going to take him to the station. You'll get your money back, all this sort of stuff. He also has pocketed some cigarettes. And as they're walking away, he's like, oh, I got some of these. Do you want some cigarettes? And Juan is like, no, I don't smoke. And so Marcos just chucks yeah. him into the street. And then later, uh, there is a point where Juan starts smoking a cigarette. And there is a, no a look on Marcos's face where he, he catches it and he realizes, oh, wait a minute, this guy does smoke. And it's an interesting moment because I'm like, okay, so he's catching onto this guy so there's there's something else going on between these characters and i thought that was a really interesting uh play you know the the use of cigarettes as you know a a ploy in this con oh i'm so glad you, you said that because there's that other moment when they're when the two are leaving the hotel and he says wait a minute i left the cigarettes and he runs back in and kisses valeria right and and then runs back out and he has the cigarettes because he's had them all along mm -hmm. uh, and he just needed to get the kiss in 
um, which was also fantastic. Uh, but uh, wow, that's that's fascinating. That's just sort of the I don't know why why is that there because everything else is so tight. That's just like a trail of breadcrumbs where Marcos could have could have figured it out. Maybe I I don't know because I'm I, I I almost want to go back and watch it again and go okay so is 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 Juan trying to to lead Marcos a certain way because of that or was that him. Um, was he playing like, oh, I'm not really a grifter. I don't smoke. I'm not going to fall for your traps only to kind of succumb to Marcos's, uh, draw later. Um, like I was like, maybe that's what it is, but I wasn't quite sure, but it's, it's definitely an interesting thread that is worth exploring some more on future watches. Uh, our deep scene dive, Andy. This is a, uh, I think it's a really interesting scene because this is kind of that moment where, Marcos points out to uh, to Juan that, you know, we're in a society of swindlers. It is happening everywhere you look. Um, and it's it's a it's a really interesting scene because it just kind of points out. And I guess this this is something that uh, that Bielinski might have been sit, trying to say about kind of society. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But it's it's uh, it's it's a great scene. And it really kind of helps also kind of cement their relationship a little bit more. It does. Where we we're about what did we say? Twenty four minutes and change into yeah. the film, and uh, after you know, being impressed with Juan's ability to improvise uh, as well as as he did in the elevator sequence, uh, Marco swindles a a newspaper, and Juan comments on him being cheap, and then Marcos lays out. This is essentially Marcos monologuing, right? Yeah, and pretty so, much. It, right. And so he he points out there are swindlers everywhere. There is there is the you know, we're just part of this machine and there are lines we will not cross. I don't carry a gun. I don't care. But we have this sort of uh, these these great cuts like to all of these the, the cons that are in the street just as they're standing in the middle of this intersection. They look around and it's it's like the Matrix reveals, you know, all of the agents. Right. That's that's <laughs> right. sort of where we're where we are uh and and supposedly this is you know on your first viewing supposedly this is where you see um that that the criminal element is everywhere we're just a part of the machine and so it's okay for us to do what we do the way that we do it exactly it's the rationalization monologue yep absolutely and it's like this is everybody's doing it we're just going to get our piece of the pie how they do it i think is fantastic first of all obviously we, we say it's monologuing it is a, a great and and wonderfully sort of blustering um uh, monologue by doreen uh, who sells it very well and makes it that much more fantastic to watch after you know that he's been played uh by a con man who is better than he is um, so that is certainly rewarding, uh, but it also is visually really interesting to watch and, and the setups of, of, you know, how they set up all these other swindlers and cons and thieves and sprinters and all the great names for them. I think it's, it's just a really well-written scene. It is. It's, uh, I mean, you know, he, he's, as he's looking around, he says, they are there, but you can't see them. That's that's what it's all about. They're there, but they aren't. So mind your briefcase, your purse, your door, your window, your car, your savings. Mind your ass because they're there, and they always will be. It's it's just this 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 sense of this kind of this dark times. And I guess Bielinski, uh, you know, he had been inspired a lot by um, by his own society because Argentina had gone through this. Um, this kind of this uh, rapid enrichment period uh, during uh, the uh, late 80s into the 90s when Menem was president. Um, all this wealth, uh, you know, had happened, uh, just kind of obscene levels of wealth. Um, but then, and they, people kind of witnessed a lot of uh, corruption and just, uh, you know, people not caring about this. It's like society kind of splitting. And he said this movie kind of reflects that reality. And I think this scene really, to a lot of people in Argentina, really highlighted a lot of stuff that they were probably seeing every day in Buenos Aires, at least. It is the moment where we get the, the cultural resonance, the cultural connection of this film to uh, to the the reality of their situation. It reminds me of uh, City of God in that way, you know, where we get these just the, the flashes of reality that come in and out of the narrative. I think it's a, it, it's a, a, a tight sort of mirror uh, to hold up for us. I think it looks really good. 
uh, and it reads well, and it's it's depressing, and it makes you certainly not want to travel there, or at least wear pants with lots of zippers. It, it definitely is something you want to uh, pay attention to, and it certainly was my experience uh, visiting South America, and I know other people who've done that, where it's just like they say, when you're in the big cities, you really need to pay attention to this sort of stuff, because it does go on, and you know the people will distract you, somebody will distract you while somebody else is kind of trying to pick your pocket, and it's just something you have to pay attention to. And I'm not saying it happens everywhere, but it's it is something that you you need to be conscious of, and it's it it can be uh, pretty shocking if it's something that you're just not used to. And I think what they're saying here is like this is unfortunately something that happens, and a lot of people are sadly used to it here. Uh, obviously, Ricardo Doreen as Marcos uh, in this scene, and Gaston Pauls as Juan. You have a you found a great quote from Pauls about him getting ready for his role. He said, "When I'm asked how I got ready for my role, I like to say that I studied Argentine politicians who are able to tell the most obvious truths with a poker face. My character does on a small scale what they do on a large scale." He is a small fish. They are sharks. <laughs> Marcelo uh, Camerino is behind the camera. We've already been singing the praises of of Camerino uh, so far, uh, but this is this is a terrific scene. Well, I love that we start off with Steadicam. Really, we're kind of following them after they've left this kind of this elevator scene that we just had. Um, we're kind of following the Steadicam, uh, nice long shot uh, as they're walking in this whole newspaper swindle that he does as they go down, uh, you know, into it, it's almost like the subway. It must be just kind of a multi-level city, like they're going down to another level to some other streets or something. But they go down the stairs and they're down into another street area, and. And, and at that point, that's when we, we kind of shift from the steady cam, and all of a sudden it's just really long lens shots, almost like you expect like a, a Donnie Brasco style, like the camera, and, and it becomes the the uh, long lens camera going chicks, 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 as we're looking at all these different yes. swindlers and everything. Yes. <laughs> Uh, that's oh, totally that's what great. It that's exactly it's the sound effect that I was missing. Right. That, just, <laughs> that nails it. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I really like about this sequence and, and you know, part to the camera work, part to the editing is I think it, it reminds me so much of Blade Runner, although much less um, sort of um, uh, pensive. Uh, but it gives us a, a, a lot of visual context, right? It's a camera and editing combination that allows us to see uh, and get, I think, a pretty good picture of where we are in the world. You know, we get to see the before and after. We get to see uh, the, you know, the first 25 minutes is essentially a walking tour of the city uh, that is punctuated only by, um, you know, these little con events to give us a sense of, of what the the life is of these guys as they're as they kind of go th- walk through the streets every day. And I think that's really cool. Um, and and uh, I, I feel like I know the place uh, as well as they need me to know it to become intimate with the narrative that that unfolds in the second act. And, and I thought that was really artful. And this sequence really is the pivot point, um, you know, because from here we move directly into um, the, um, you know, the hotel call where we get the sort of big inciting incident uh, and, and the con starts apace. The, yeah, the, the, we get a lot of the streets of Buenos Aires through the, this first part of the film where we're kind of traveling a bit as, there, as Marcos kind of takes Juan under his wing, as it were, or at least as he yeah. understands it. And as, as he's kind of slowly working his way to his quote unquote office, which is kind of a table in the back of a restaurant, as he can start putting some stuff together. And I think it's, it's a pretty interesting um, way, like you said, we really get a sense of space and we get a sense of the city. We get a sense of kind of just it as this, this entity that is breathing this life. And it's, but it's interesting because up until this point, like we've seen quite a bit of the city, but it's never seen uh, seemed so uh, kind of dark and shady as it uh, as it really has up until this point. And after this point, I mean, that's when we start getting uh, motorcyclists driving by, grabbing our bags and stuff like that. And it becomes a much more dangerous city after this point, just like he says. And I found that really interesting that that's kind of how it plays out. I do too, and that's a really great point because up into up to that moment in the film. Uh, they are the worst element on the streets. Exactly. Right? They are the element that you're supposed to fear the most, and it only gets worse from there. Yeah, exactly. Really interesting. So cool. Uh, what do you think of the music, Cesar Lerner? 
I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I didn't think it was like anything that uh, that I'd kind of put on and listened to, but I did like that it had, especially in this scene when he's when he's monologuing, we get this really kind of this dark jazzy vibe in the score as Marcos does his speech. And I felt it really fit the tone very nicely. I think that the overall over the course of the film, the music fits the the just the tone of this this uh, this thriller really well. Um, but this particular moment, I don't know, something about that kind of jazziness just felt very much like the life of a swindler. It felt very kind of, you never quite knew exactly what notes were going to be hit. And I, I really liked that. I don't think this is something that I would really put on, but um, I, I, and this is not specifically to this scene that we're talking about, but the opening scene too, I think is really interesting what they chose to do with the music. It's really sparse. Um, it, it's really, sp- like there is no music. It's all in that sound, yeah. uh, uh, you know, through the first grift, right? The, the first con. And then when he makes the decision to do the second con, we get some very strange, low, like, synthy tones that I found totally unpredictable. Like, I did not know where they were where they were going with the with the score elements in that film. And I think that uh, sort of set the stage for the music for me for the rest of the movie. Like, I never quite knew what I was going to hear. And I was always surprised by the, the tone and style that they chose scene by scene, uh, which which was interesting. It made it... Um, uh, it, it sort of fit the what I was actually learning about the narrative pretty well. Yeah, it worked really nicely. Uh, editing, we already mentioned. I at least celebrate the editing in product in in uh, partnership with uh, Camerino's camera editing is done by uh, was performed by Sergio Zotola and uh, sound by Mario. Calabresi sound mixer. Any other notes on those guys? No, other than just the, just what we've said already, just the way that the scene is cut together and just kind of like the the quick shots as they're panning uh, back uh, and we're looking at all these different con artists pulling their their cons. Um, it just it cuts nicely. It works really well in uh, partnership with what uh, Darin is saying. Um, I, I think you know kudos to all these guys for bringing it all together really nicely. We haven't mentioned, uh, oh, I don't want to butcher her name. Can you do Le- it? Leticia Bredici? Bredice? Bre- Bredici? Bredice. It, she played uh, Valeria. She was fantastic. I, I found her really compelling, and uh, she worked very well to play that. Um, you know, I am a manager of a hotel, and I'm always on, and I'm always smiling and everything. But you could just see what was going on underneath her. Uh, you know, just it, you, it, she had that presence, and I really enjoyed her in this role. And I enjoyed especially the moment where her brother basically tells her, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. Uh, it's just like, oh my, this is insane. Like this, <laughs> this guy is so terrible. And of course, she's just like, look, I know you're not ever going to kill me. Um, but it's just like, but it gets to that point. Um, and she actually agrees to uh, to sleep with this this uh, this um, uh, mark that uh, that um, they're trying to get Vidal. It's it was really interesting watching the relationship between these two. It's a very strange family dynamic, right? It it <laughs> oh, it's sort of indecent proposal uh, incestuously, right? You know, like uh, this. It, it's just. Uh, hard to watch and that she goes through with it in the course of the film the first time it feels really grim really really dark uh, yes. uh, until you realize that uh, you know at the end of the film you realize oh there was no threat at all that's fantastic um uh, you know i love that that they let him through that sequence too they let doreen sleep the, the whole night i thought that was great right <laughs> Uh, Oscar Nunez as Sandler. Uh, we've got the, the whole crew here. Oscar Nunez as Sandler, Ignacy Abadal as Vidal Gandolfo, uh, Tomas Fonzi as Federico, the uh, younger brother, and Elsa Berenguer as Berta. Great team of people here. Uh, um, Oscar Nunez as Sandler, kind of the 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 old partner, or not old partner, but just the the you know somebody that he knew who's having the heart attack, who's got this deal and. He's got to get this these stamps sold. Just the, the way they set all of this up is so smart. Uh, in particular, I love uh, when he goes to Elsa's place as Berta, and uh, she's got like this young man, uh, you know, just 
lover that she's with. It just the way that that scene played out, just I mean, it just, it just had me in stitches with this guy just <laughs> sitting in the background watching watching like game shows or sitcoms or something, right. and occasionally <laughs> the music. Again, that's a great example. The music would just change tones completely, and it would become like slapstick. Like yeah. it sound, it would sound like a slapstick sequence. She was fantastic. Yeah. It's as if he went to see Joan Rivers, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> she was great. She was that great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so the the cast all around was fantastic. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, yeah, very satisfying. How to do it award seasons. I, seasons, all of the seasons. Uh, all of the How to seasons. do it award season. <laughs> uh, it did well. It, 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 it garnered 22 wins and eight other nominations, um, specifically at the Argentine Film Critics Association Awards, the Silver Condor, which is pretty much like their Academy Awards. It ended up winning seven and nominated for another three. So it was nominated for 10 awards, which is fantastic. It won uh, Best Film, Best Director, Best Actor, Ricardo Doreen, Best Supporting Actress. We already uh, just mentioned how much we loved Elsa Berenguer as El, as Berta, she uh, won a supporting actress uh, nominee or an award for that. Best original screenplay, best cinematography, and best editing. Um, so really great job. And then it was also nominated for best first film. It lost to Felicidades by Lucho Bender. Uh, best music, it lost to Waiting for the Messiah by uh, Cesar Lerner and uh, Marcelo Mog- Mogilevsky. I'm trying to get that one right. Um, so, you know, so at least at least in that particular case, um, he lost to himself. Um, Cesar did. And Art Direction, uh, it was nominated for, uh, but lost to Nuts for Love by uh, Maria Clara Notari. So, um, yeah, it did it did pretty well for itself at the award season. Um, it didn't really make a, enough of a splash in the U.S. to, to garner a, a foreign film nomination. But uh, we'll definitely be talking about those in later Darin films. Now, you already mentioned that this was remade in 2004, Criminal, um, uh, starring John C. Riley. It's has it been remade elsewhere? Yes, it has. I almost think it would be <laughs> that was a dumb leading uh, question. It was <laughs> <laughs> other remakes. <laughs> I, it would be fun to track these down. Actually, I guess there is a Hindi version of the story called Bluffmaster, which is a hilarious title. Uh, made in 2005, and a Malayalam uh, film uh, made as Gulumal, The Escape, in 2009. So, yeah, there's there's four versions of this film floating around out there, which is pretty interesting. Uh, now, you mentioned that this was a, a contest win for Bilinski, uh, so we have a hint at what it cost him to make it, but I am deeply excited to hear if he made any money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from what I could find... Um, it said, as far as the contest goes, that it gave the, they gave him a budget of one point three million. I found somewhere else that that he had a budget of one point five million. So I wasn't exactly sure what the the final budget number was, but somewhere in that area. But that is about two point one million in today's U.S. dollars. His movie opened August thirty first, two thousand, in Argentina, and it became you'll be happy to know a huge critical and commercial success. I couldn't find any Argentine-specific information, unfortunately, but internationally, the movie did go on to make $11.2 million. and here in the States, the movie, it didn't open until April 19th, 2002, where it had a limited release of five screens opposite Murder by Numbers, everyone's favorite Sandra Bullock movie, and of course, The Scorpion King, which gave us The Rock. Um, it did eventually play on 36 screens ac- across the country and went on to make $1.2 million, uh, here in the States. This means the movie made $12.4 million around the world, which is about $17.4 million in today's dollars. So it made back eight times its budget and ended up with an adjusted profit per finished minute of $134,000. There you go. Well, that is fantastic because, uh, first of all, it, it sets the stage for Bielinski. And second, we get much more Darin in many more fantastic movies. So um, uh, great on all counts. Uh, this is, you know, I, we already said this is a huge... Uh, a break for us, but uh, what a great chance to to start a new series uh, that is w- we walked into totally blind and be so satisfying. Um, I I'm thrilled. I am too. I'm so excited to watch the rest of his films because I had such a great time with this one, and uh, it, I just feel like this is an actor who I really want to see more of. He's just he's so compelling on screen, um, and actually, I mean. As much as I love uh, Darin and this series is about him, 
I would say that about um, about Paul's also. I really enjoyed watching uh, Gaston Paul's on screen. He was just he was great as Juan. Yeah, totally agree. Everybody in here, I think, was just really fun. Um, so uh, we have, uh, I think, we're starting in a great place. Uh, to go ahead and rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel or just swipe over in your show notes on your podcast uh, listening device of choice. And uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and see how this one stacks up uh, on your list. All right. First off, we talked about possibly having a new <laughs> brother block and here it is. Nine Queens or Star Trek Beyond, Pete. <laughs> Andy, uh, this is Nine Queens for me. It's absolutely Nine Queens for me, too. What a fantastic film it is. Yeah. Nine Queens or Seven Samurai. We just need something with eight in the middle. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I am uh, Nine Queens on this one. I'm Nine Queens as well. Nine Queens or Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Uh, Nine Queens. I, I feel like I would say Star Trek II... But maybe it's just because this movie got me so excited. I actually am going to say Nine Queens. I think that's I think that's okay. <laughs> I think that's okay. There we are. Nine Queens or All the President's Men. Um, I'm All the President's Men on this one. I am too. All right. Nine Queens or Snowpiercer. Um, I am Nine Queens on this one. I am Snowpiercer on this one. How Snowpiercer are you? I'm a loose Snowpiercer. I could give you Nine Queens. Damn, I'm, <laughs> kind of a, I'm kind of a loose Nine Queens, Andy. <laughs> I think we probably uh, need to, to to go to the mat on this one just, you know. Just because we don't know what we're doing. Just because we're, we maybe we're out of practice. Yeah. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> All right, here we okay, go. Okay, ready? One, two, two three, three paper. Rock. Oh, oh, look at oh. that. There you go. Nine Queens takes it. Nine Queens or room, definitely room for me. Uh, yes, it is room for me as well. Nine Queens or Casino Royale. I'll stick with Bond. Bond, please. Nine Queens or Paranorman? I'm saying Paranorman Interesting. here. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Uh, I, yeah, okay. I, I'll tell you, I think I'm Paranorman. I, we just, there's a, an exhibit at our, you know, the Portland Art Museum. It's the uh, Studio Leica um, exhibit. And they're offering tours of the Studio Leica. And they've got all these fantastic features. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really invested in Leica right now. And I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to balance, am I biased? Or, no, I, I, think I'm, I think that's legit. They're pretty great. I think Paranorman, yeah. yeah. Nine Queens or Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. It's a great little Shane Black one. I'm actually gonna say Nine Queens though. I think I'm I think I'm Kiss Kiss. Okay. Well let's, let's do it again. All right. Let's do it again. Here yeah. we go. One, one two, two, three, three scissors. Paper. Oh. Totally read your number on that one. You did. Well, yeah. look at that. Yeah. Nine Queens made it to thirty on our flick chart. Thirty out of three hundred twenty-three. That is a great start for our yeah. Ricardo Darín series. That's so exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. What did this do for your um, your personal flick chart? My personal flick chart. I uh, this really shot up there pretty high. It ended up three ten out of thirty-eight sixty-two. So that put it at about a ninety-two percent. It's really high for me. It shot up. <laughs> Really, uh, really, really high for me. Uh, it landed at twenty-seven out of nine out of a thousand. Wow! And uh, so that's a ninety-seven percent for me, and a, a strong five star and a like on Letterbox as a result. That is fantastic. I'm I'm at a four and a half right now, but I don't I I don't think that. Um, I think that it's, it's maybe a loose four and a half. I think on subsequent viewings, it might go up to five. But right now, it's at a four and a half. Yeah, I I hope it does. And I hope this isn't just the, the sort of requisite hangover, uh, the star heart hangover uh, of just watching this movie today. Um, I... I, I will say that that I think I'm maybe more of an apologist for some of the some of the twists and turns that might you might categorize as ridiculous in other movies because this film is so internally consistent. You know, it 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 develops its world and its universe and the rules that it lives by so early and so competently uh, that. Uh, any of the twists and things that might otherwise be unbelievable um, are 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 played, you know, truthfully to itself. And I I I buy it. I buy it. I am I am sold. Great film. 
I absolutely agree. Yeah, and it's one of those ones where I'm like, I, I have to question, like, why why am I keeping it from that extra half star? Like, what is it? And yeah. I, I, I can't pin it down. So that's why I really want to watch it again and go, okay, you know, is there a reason that I'm? it's not just getting a five star for me? But uh, I have to think about it. But You do. You you offer five stars, I think, uh, it, some might say indiscriminately. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a puzzle while, yeah, while, right. while you're holding this bag. I, I really wonder. Pete, I will tell you right now, this is the start of a really long con. I'm, I'm pulling on you. <laughs> wow. I don't normally don't give that away, but <laughs> <laughs> this is where it begins That's right, right now. Cue the cigarettes. Uh, where do we go from here, Andy? Well, as we have alluded, we are going to be continuing uh, with Ricardo, and it's actually his his very next uh, film. Uh, actually, I, I take that back. It's not his very next film. He well, I think it. it maybe he had two come out the following year. Do uh, <laughs> are I'm you? Are you sure? I'm very wishy washy <laughs> about this whole thing, Pete. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he. Uh, this was 2000. He had two films come out in 2001. He had La Fuga and Son of the Bride. Um, and Son of the Bride, that is the film we are going to be talking about next week. Have you watched it yet? I haven't. I'm hoping to get it started tonight, though. Very excited about watching that movie now, especially uh, that we have done this one and had such a good time with it. So that's it. Uh, well, we got to put a fork in it, Andy, because you know when the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth. Andy. As Amazon always doeth. Yeah, the Amazon didn't give us much this week. <laughs> no, it really didn't. Probably, probably to be predicted. I mean, you know, given Amazon's, you know, kind of where Amazon exists in the movie uh, uh, ecosystem, but there aren't a whole lot of reviews for Nine Queens. Uh, we've only got 91. There are no one star reviews, and there are only two two star reviews. So we're going to do them both. Yes, we are. Uh, Andy, would you be? Uh, would you do the honors? Yeah, I'm going to kick it off. This is um, by Sari, who said, "Better memories." I ordered this after not seeing it for a long time. The memory was much better than the film. So slow and so dated. Some of the acting was painful. Mm. Wow. A customer follows that up with con artist caper. Subpar con artist flick, two con men attempt to pull off the impossible, selling a valuable stamp set to a wealthy financier. The twists and turns that occur are outrageous, and the ending is so weak it makes the viewer feel conned. Then again, perhaps that's what the director intended. Not recommended. Mm. I think we may have seen different movies. That's (laughs) how bad these reviews are. I'm sorry, customer. I'm sorry, but my goodness, you should watch this movie again. Yeah, they should, absolutely. Jeez. Thanks, Amazon. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our originals page when shopping for books and movies we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. I was so excited for our big Star Trek film franchise series this season. All those movies adapted from Gene Roddenberry's original 1960s TV show. As a huge fan, I know that you geeked out over analyzing the adaptations. Absolutely. From the motion picture to the Kelvin timeline films, seeing the Enterprise crews on the big screen was a dream come true. Our list of source material isn't just all books and plays. We have the original series in our list of source material. You can rent the episodes to watch and enjoy and support the show in the process. For our Millennium Trilogy series, we covered films adapted from the original books that launched Lizbeth Salander, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Girl Who Played with Fire, and The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. As much as I love Fincher's version, the original Swedish versions are the way to go. 
We also did our Die Hard series in season seven. I can't believe Die Hard and Die Hard 2 were adaptations. Two of the greatest action movies ever. Well, one of them at least. The other is awfully fun, though. We revisited the classic Mary Poppins for our 1960s movie musical series. A spoonful of sugar always helps the medicine go down. Old Boy was intense for our Park Chan-wook Vengeance trilogy. And East of Eden and Giant were highlights of our James Dean series. And a fun time travel mind bender with predestination to cap things off. Find all the books behind these adaptations and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Dive into the source material for your favorite movies. Check it out today. Thenextreel.com slash originals. Originals.